good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are now at this uh, time. Um, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you back uh, to this 19th um, International Web for All conference. We are starting this second day um, with a session six on web accessibility. Um, today in this session, we have two communication papers, uh, one of which is one of the best communication paper candidate and three technical papers. Um, as you all know, the uh, authors of communication papers have 10 minutes uh, for their presentations plus five minutes for Q&A and the technical paper authors will have um, 15 minutes for their talks and that would be followed by a five minutes Q&A um, session. So um, let's kick it off with the first paper uh, entitled Optimizing the Website Accessibility Conformance Evaluation Methodology by Alexander Hamley, uh, Yeliz Yesilada, Mark Vigo, and Simon Harper, um, which is one of the best communication paper candidates. Hi uh, there, so I hope that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, all right, I'll just share my screen now. Good. Okay, so yeah, I hope you can see the screen. Yeah, we can see your slides. The floor is yours. Okay, so yeah, uh, my name is Alex, um, and I'm presenting uh, our paper today. It's called Optimizing Website Accessibility Conformance Methodology. Um, sorry, Conformance Evaluation Methodology. All right, so, um, so before we get started into our methodology, um, I'm just going to explain the WCAG EM a little bit. Um, now, it's obviously a accessibility conference, so um, some people will already know this, but I think it's important just for some context. So it's an evaluation methodology, and it's the de facto standard. Um, however, there's some limitations we've, that we've identified. Um, now, an evaluation methodology is something that auditors, these are people who evaluate web pages, will use to facilitate their evaluation. And they evaluate against WCAG. Um, WCAG is well known, so I'm not going to explain that in too much detail, but um, WCAG EN is kind of the only real current methodology that's used. Um, there were some before, like UWEM, and there's some other methods that integrate WCAG EN into sort of wider methodologies. Um, and today we're going to be focused on step one of WCAG EN. Uh, there are five steps, and each, um, each step can feed back into step one, step two, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, today we're focused on step one. Okay, so um, on the screen here is a diagram of our methodology. Uh, on the left are five sections. So you can see that it runs parallel to WCAG EM. Um, and step one is in sort of a, a large circle and surrounding this large circle are six smaller circles. These are coverage, representativeness, complexity, popularity, freshness, and accessibility. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, th these, these six steps um, or stages address some concerns that we have with WCAG EM. Um, some steps produce sort of quantifiable, uh, you know, numerical metrics that we can use to um, compare things against, and others will uh, sort of produce more, um, sort of less, less quantifiable or more sort of qualitative metrics. Um, for example, like representativeness. Um, so we're going to go through these um, in order. Starting with coverage. Um, coverage st strives to balance uh, the selection policy, the crawler throughput, and politeness um, for, web, for web crawlers. Uh, coverage for um, other sort of population sort of methods will, will, will be explained later. But yeah, for web, for web crawlers or for pages that have been sourced from them, um, that's what it's concerned about. Uh, selection policy is a term uh, that we use in, 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 web, in web crawler space. Um, and web crawlers, for anyone who doesn't know, are just essentially robots that, that sort of traverse through a site. 
Um, a wider selection policy uh, means that the coil throughput will increase. And when this coil throughput increases, um, we affect politeness. Uh, politeness is a term, uh, and it's not just about being nice. Um, it's about things like not um, DDoSing a site, so not sort of um, denial of service attacking it, which can sort of be um, unintentional. Um, there are, there, yes, as I said, there are other ways of downloading pages from a site. Um, one example is server log files, and there are different methods of crawling. Um, this talk hasn't got the time to explain these metrics in detail. Um, next one. So yeah, um, on the right hand side of the, of the screen here, uh, there's a distribution. Uh, we can see uh, three different metrics. Um, we have server log files. Uh, this produced the greatest coverage in our test. We have breadth first crawling and depth first crawling. Um, and so we can see here that, as I said, um, there's, there, 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 is, there is quite a big difference between the, the crawling and the server log files. This is significant. And coverage is measured in our metric as the, the, the as the tested population method over the union of all these different methods. And the difference is down to the nature of these different population sourcing methods. Um, for example, depth first crawling, as the name implies, crawls quite deep into website. And we found on our test website that when this happens, we get very, very similar pages over and over again. Um, whereas breadth first crawling, as, as again, the name implies, it's more broad. And so it prioritizes different types of pages. Um, we can see here server log files has even better coverage than this. Um, okay, so this page here um, shows, a sort of, uh, I'm not sure what the technical term is, but like an onion diagram I've been calling it. And um, this, this diagram is showcasing a website, a target population and samples from that target population. Um, and it's an important diagram because it shows um, transitive important, um, importance. So um, the population, target population, isn't the same thing as a website. And this is the case for Wikigame, it's the case for our, for, for our optimized methodology as well. Um, and we're not drawing samples, or we will not be drawing samples at a later stage from a website. We'll be drawing it from a target population. But it's really important that those samples are representative of, of the target population, which is one of the concerns we have with WCAG-EM. That I'll explain later on. Um, but it's transitively important that those samples are also representative of the wider population, sorry, uh, 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 which is the website. So. Um, this diagram is kind of here to avoid ambiguity. Um, and yeah, as I said, in later steps, we'll draw samples. Um, and again, I'll explain that in a second. Okay, so, hang on. So yeah, complexity. Now we have, another, we have another distribution on the right that I'll explain in a second. I'll just go through uh, uh, the metric first. So, Pages can be in different states. Um, for example, a, an email client can show an inbox, but it can also show a composing view on, on that web page. And if you look at the URL, it's the same URL, right? But the page is in a different state. Um, and this increases complexity. Um, you know, we often call these pages rich internet applications. Um, because they're essentially substitutes for desktop application. Uh, any, another, another example is something like Google Maps. Um, so these, these sort of replicate these traditional applications. Um, another another uh, sort of facet that can increase complexity is the age of pages. So um, web pages that are uh, newer are generally made with perhaps arguably accessibility in mind, whereas pages that are, that are older might not have been made 
when, uh, you know, for example, there, were, there weren't legal pressures to be accessible. These also have, uh, are often made in, in what, what we call an ad hoc manner. So, um, you know, they're not part of a templated site. They're, you know, they might just be made by someone uh, putting some HTML in the page as opposed to using templates. Um, so this, this is essentially inconsistency and inconsistency uh, also increases complexity. Um, so we can see on the right hand side, a distribution again. And we can see, and we can see here that actually um, with our test populations, all, all drawn from the same, um, same website, but different, you know, different methods of sourcing it. Uh, we found that actually um, crawling produces more complex pages. And although there's a difference in the populations, those, those, those crawling methods actually produce very, very similar pages. And we can see here that uh, server log files didn't. Okay, um, popularity. This is the web page's hit rate. Uh, this is only a quick one. Um, but uh, server log files, for example, they, pro they, they produce this feature that we can use. Uh, you know, this isn't always the case. Um, you know, crawling doesn't produce this feature. However, it's a, it's a metric that we can look at and some metric that we can use to prioritize potentially different pages. Um, next up, we have freshness. So freshness is really interesting. I think um, it's about how up to date the sample is. Um, crawling very large sites can have an impact on freshness, um, you know, less so on smaller sites, but larger sites, for example, have, um, have problems where the first pages that you crawl might not be relevant anymore. Um, log files have uh, an interesting feature with their coverage and freshness. Um, we can see in the, the graphs here that um, as, as we increase the, with the window for server log files, the coverage that we have increases. But again, our freshness is impacted by the coverage. Perhaps the sample isn't as relevant anymore because these pages aren't wanted by users. Um, okay, the last feature we're going to talk about today, just to keep in time, is accessibility. Um, we found uh, so we we ran Axe. Axe is an accessibility tool that will produce critical, serious, moderate, or minor um, definitions for accessibility. Um, So accessibility won't potentially be used in, 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 a, in a final tool that we develop because um, it, it can be quite computationally expensive, but it's important to have a look at it or an indication at these different populations. Um, it gives us again, another numerical metric that we can use to compare. Um, yeah, so the graph shows the depth first results are, are skewed slightly by um, serious barriers. And also there are no critical barriers in this population. So we don't really consider the, the depth versus uh, results in this comparison, um, simply because the results are, uh, you, you know, we need critical barriers to, to answer um, in our population. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna spend one minute on the problems with WCAG EM, the problems that we're trying to address. Um, so, the first problem is the selection criteria or determining the target population. WCAGM doesn't use established population defining methods um, when defining its target population. Uh, you know things like inclusion or exclusion criterion. Uh, these aren't these aren't present. What's actually present is um, something something that's known as the principle of website enclosure, um, and what we call the scope of, of applicability. Uh, but this isn't an established population definition methodology. Um, common pages are something that's, that, that's also mentioned in WCAG EM. And common pages are pages and page states that are relevant to the entire website. However, relevancy isn't defined. Um, so do, do, you know, do these common pages need to be on every page or just some pages or most pages? Um, the manual identification of, this common, of these common pages is the biggest problem, however, um, because 
it introduces subjectivity and potential bias in the sample. Um, and that makes it non-probabilistic. And auditors are professionals. However, when they identify the pages, um, it's just statistically not possible to be non-probabilistic at that point. Sorry, to be probabilistic at that point. Um, and there's no statistical support for the pages that have been chosen. Um, the evaluation of every page in a sample utilizes a limited resource from you know by the auditors, um, and at this scale is quite high. Uh, you know the workload in evaluating the number of pages is quite high. Um, lastly, there's no focused integration of automated and manual evaluation. So we think a focused approach that can optimize both auditors and tools would be very very useful. Um, okay, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Alex, um, for this very interesting presentation. Um, are there any questions um, for Alex? Let me check the chat as well. Uh, oh, there is Donald that sent a message previously. Hopefully, this has been solved. Um, I will check as well quickly because we don't have too much time, but I will check also Slack. Uh, just as a reminder, there is a channel for this session, so you can also ask your questions there. No? Okay, so maybe I can uh, ask a question uh, from the reviewers. Um, uh, one of them was um, for future work and testing of this methodology. Um, what type of websites do you have in mind? Yeah, so it, it's really, really important that we test it on lots of different types of websites. Mm -hmm. So we've tested it so far on our university website. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's really, really important that we test it on, for example, um, you know, websites that have a range of different types of pages. Uh, whether they're sort of like commercial kind of e-commerce sites or whether they're news sites or uh, you know education sites it's really really important that we test it on all, on, on, all, on all these different types we have a um we have a paper that we have planned that will test a, a, you know the tool on these different types of sites great yeah um any other questions Maybe I will just ask a second a second question from from the reviewers, um, which I believe is also quite important. So, um, how important is selection of a sample by functionality of the pages? Um, yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, uh, definitely. This is the um, this is one of the interesting. Uh, parts with WIC IDM, right? Yeah, so um, exactly. You know, it, it, it identifies common pages mm -hmm. or pages that are important. However, um, if we look at the, the server log files, there's a phenomenon where pages that are deemed important might not even be accessed. Um, so it's it's striking a balance between um, between that. We found that server log files are pages that um, you know, a page won't appear in a server log file if it hasn't actually been used. So we so we feel like um, this definitely um, kind of addresses some of you know some of the, you know, partially that problem. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely important that we include um, you know kind of in, important functionality. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, as as you mentioned, is one maybe of the, um, of yeah, the problems of the, you that you know, found. One of the ways that we sample is through, um, you know, through clustering. And 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 when you cluster, um, depending on the clustering approach and the sensitivity of that approach, um, you know, we can we can draw samples from these different clusters. So that 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 will naturally have pages that are, um, you know, perhaps part of a login process or something like that. You know, they'll be in their own cluster. So they will be included. Yeah, yeah. No, but I do definitely agree that um, sampling by, for instance, the most frequent sites that are visited uh, can have more relevance than just picking up different pages with different functionality. 
yeah, uh, when maybe they are not being visited. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Right, thank you very much. Cheers. So um, let's move on to the uh, next paper, um, which is entitled Framework for Experiential Transcoding of Web Pages with ScanPath Trend Analysis. And I'm not sure who is going to present it. Ah, Simon? It'll be me. <laughs> oh, OK. OK, okay. perfect. Um, um, so the floor is yours. Thank you. OK, can you see the slides OK? Yes, we can. Brilliant. OK, um, hi, uh, morning, everybody. I'm um, Simon, or should I say evening for some people. Um, uh, so I want to talk with you today about some work that I've been doing with some of my colleagues at the Middle Eastern Technical University. Um, and this is on um, a thing called experiential transcoding. So what does this experiential thing mean to start with? Well, it's based on the premise that graphic designers typically are cited. They build things visually. Visual design rules are, are exactly that. They're for people who can see the pages. Um, and there's a lot of implicit information in those visual designs. And because there's a lot of implicit information, some of that is lost. Um, especially um, the things that are most important when it, when, when it comes to transcoding web pages for, um, for screen readers or for screen readers in general. And so therefore, um, what we're trying to do is sort of re, um, you know, pull apart those pages, put them back together again in a way that allows us to more accurately represent the visual uh, the visual intention, if you like, of the graphic designers who built them. So that's sort of the, the kind of the background for it. And um, here you can see that we've uh, on the on the right hand side, we've got a web page, which is the Apple web page. Um, and it's got lots of lots of visual clutter all over, it, including menus at the top and some um, uh, various graphics and um, to the right and uh, four little graphic boxes uh, uh, along the bottom. Um, the linear order um, that, uh, that, uh, um, that it would be experienced in um, for a screen reader user would be that the menu is first spoken, um, there's a second part of the menu that's spoken, uh, then it goes on to look at um, the sort of uh, these two small little boxes floating in the middle of space uh, to one side because they then the next part of the linear order in the code base. Then we get to see um, the um, the actual title that it's the, the iPad mini. So we have to wait uh, three or four uh, sort of fourth, third or fourth in the queue comes the iPad mini, which is what we're actually focused on. Then there's a picture of the iPad mini and then it goes on to these little sort of um, uh, uh, four little boxes um, under the iPad mini um, visualization. Now, the thing here is that the linear order is much different to the visual order that we've under, that we can understand from um, seeing how people actually interact with the page, and also the difference in the visual browsing order and the visual search order is also something that's significant in this context. And so, this disparity means that people who are using a screen reader are going to be at a disadvantage when it comes to making fast decisions or decisions about search. Uh, and decisions about when they're browsing than, um, than a sighted user or somebody not using um, the screen reader because of the way that the screen reader interacts with the page. And so we're, what we're trying to do is, we're not trying to fix the um, screen readers. Uh, what we're trying to do is fix the pages, so and transcode the pages so that the screen reader can experience them um, in the kind of faster order, if you like. That's the plan. Um, so experiential transcoding, I've already sort of, have spoken with you about a little bit and uh, what we can see on this particular page is that there's a web page and then there's lots of little dots on that page the dots are different are different sizes and there's lines joining them up and this is called a scan path and this is a scan path from one individual and what we're doing is tracking where they're looking on the page so we can understand what are the most visually salient aspects um, so the the sort of fixation points of these dots and how long they remain um, in a particular position is the size of the dot. Um, and 
it looks very, um, just for one individual, it looks very complicated. It's a very complicated mesh of, um, of dots and, and arcs from the, which signifies the order where they're looking. So what we need to do is try and, what we first needed to do is to try to understand what this was all about. How could we understand these kind of nodes and arcs? And we can see that um, the, the, the more people look at a page, the more it becomes complicated in where people are looking. So here I'm showing um, uh, another graphic and that graphic has one eye track on it. And then it has another eye track overlaid on it. And then it has another set of eye tracks overlaid on it. And now it just looks like a whole bunch of, of multicolored dots and arcs. Um, and it's very difficult to understand where people are looking, in what order they're looking and how long they're looking at this particular bit of the web page. So we came up many years ago with this thing called the scan path trend analysis. And what we were trying to do here is take a very complicated set of scan paths from lots and lots of different users who are all looking at a particular web page, finding some way to, to push, to um, aggregate that together into one particular scan path and that one particular scan path is the thing that is um, uh, that, that that we're trying to get to and so therefore this one particular scan path will show us the order in which different parts of the page are experienced by pretty much everybody who's been part a participant in the eye tracking this particular work um, is just describing really the um, extra system and this system is a system for um, uh, for taking a web page and pulling it apart and reorganizing it, doing this experiential transcoding based on the STA algorithm, which is a web service, by the way. So if anybody wants to use the STA web service, then um, they can. Um, and uh, that's available for people to use online. So you can um, send your own data to it and it will give you back your um, the, the, the scan path that you'd like. And so this system allows you to pull apart web pages and put them back together in different ways. The thing um, on this system architecture diagram that you can see here, which um, actually is, is really just, um, it just says that we've got an STA module, we've got a transcoding module, which is the module that pulls things apart and sticks it out to the web browser. The STA module just is the thing that looks for the, for the web service. The interesting point is this thing called the VIPS module. The VIPS module is a module that, that uses the VIPS web service, which is not ours, but it's a web service which is um, uh, available for anybody to use. And this allows you to split your page up into these different blocks. So it gives you an idea of different blocks or different clusters of elements together so that we can actually understand um, what sort of uh, what blocks of elements are most relevant to be clustered together. OK, so we have a number of options um, for the uh, extra um, uh, um, uh, browser extension and uh, the extra um, application. Um, and this is we have the transcoding. Um, version. We have the STA based version. Um, we have the show other elements version. So this is an interesting one because the STA version only um, pulls out elements that are within the, the trending scan path that people look at, but it might be useful to see other elements that aren't actually included. So when we say show other elements, it means we want you to look at both the STA algorithms, but then we're going to show you everything that's on the page, even if people in our studies don't look at them. Okay, so even if they're completely ignored, we, you can still have them on the, on the transcoded version. And then, of course, um, there's the turn off all the transcoding. So what do we get? Well, um, I'm not going, it, this, this slide says that there's a, a demo that's going to be, that, that we have. Um, I'm not going to show you the demo um, because you can, you can go off and do that yourself, actually. Um, this, this system will be available for download, and so you can install it yourself in the future. Um, but it really, we've got two graphics. One graphic on the left-hand side is step one, which just shows you the same an, um, Apple web page highlighted with all the um, red squares, which are boxes around the particular clusters of, um, of, of web page um, uh, uh, Chrome, if you like, web page components. And then they have a particular order. And then there's another one that shows you the step two, which is the version transcoded in a linear order, but the linear order is the, um, the order in which 
things are experienced by somebody who's, um, or by the, scan, the, the trending scan path, if you like. And so you can see that there is a difference here. Now, what we wanted to understand is, even though there's a difference, is it significant? Is it useful? Is it not useful? And so we did a primary evaluation with uh, four out of our six web pages. People were looking at a browsing task. Um, there were 10 participants out of the 40 participants that were selected that we used. And we then put this through the IBM or Eclipse A designer tool, uh, which allowed us to understand um, how things would be um, uh, perceived. And so we first get access times, and we can see here that we've got the Apple, the AVG, the Babylon, and the Yahoo web pages. Um, the original times for access for these, um, Apple is 13 seconds, AVG is 31 seconds, Babylon is 35, and Yahoo is 38. Transcoded, this is, Apple is eight, so we can see it's about 50% quicker. Um, AVG is 12 say 13, so we can see that that's around 60% quicker. Um, and then we've got Babylon, which is 35, which is about the same. And there's a reason for that, which we can come to. And then Yahoo, which is uh, 12. So that's again, around three times uh, faster. Um, we now have a page, which is, which is uh, on the next slide, we have a, um, a a table which looks at the perceivability, operability, and understandability and robustness of these pages. And we can see that from the original to transcoded, mostly everything stays not too, doesn't change too much. There are some notable changes, of course, certainly with regard to operability and perceivability. Perceivability is the most important one. And we can see that the perceivability rates increase drastically in the transcoded version as opposed to the original version. So I think that this is something that is useful for us to um, understand. <clears throat> we can also um, see that there are um, uh, increases in the robustness and understandability of uh, web pages for the transcoded version, but they're not as um, large as you would expect from the perceivability version, but it obviously means that our re-engineering has done something to robustness. Okay, so what are the future directions? Well, um, there's a couple of things, and this works back to the Babylon um, web page. So the Babylon web page is actually quite a well-built web page with lots of internal structure and um, section headings. What, what um, by passing it through a designer, we see that those section headings are actually quite a good thing to keep. And our system, because they're not visual, has got rid of them. So that's why there's no real change in, in, um, in accessibility or speed of access. So this thing is really important. So what we're going to do in the future is try to have some idea of some sort of smart uh, system whereby when it's got lots of accessibility cues already available, we'll keep those cues even though sighted users aren't looking at them because um, screen reader users are going to be looking, are going to be using them. So what we want to do in our smart version is kind of, it's sort of the, um, the visual components get, re get transcoded and the non-visual components, if present, are kept so that um, they can still be used to the benefit of um, people using um, uh, screen readers. And so hopefully this means that when we also um, come to test this with people as opposed to with a designer, we would expect that we're going to see a big boost in productivity and speed um, for people getting through web pages and having a proper understanding of the work that, that's on those pages. Okay, hopefully I've got, I'm slightly out of, uh, out of time there, but hopefully um, uh, we've got any time for, uh, time for a few questions. Um, I'm done, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, this way. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, we are a little bit uh, behind schedule, but maybe we can have a few questions for Simon, quick ones. Um, I think Ted was asking through the chat something very specific about, about one of your slides. slides. Um, so are the stretch images in the linear view resized to show popularity of eye tracking or just an issue with how the images are stretching to fill their new linear layout? Yeah, they're just a, that, that's just a facet. It's, uh, it's, yeah, the linear, that's just a facet of the presentation, actually. It wouldn't okay. be like that in the, in, actually on the page. Thank you. Any questions? 
Uh, maybe if I may, I can just ask you one of the questions proposed by the reviewers. Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, do you believe that the mental model of sighted people that trigger the fixations used by by the STA and the resulting interaction of blind people with the transcoded web pages are similar? And if not, do you see that transcoded web page impacting negatively on the overall user experience? So I think that, um, uh, so we had some initial early um, work um, when we were developing the STA algorithm that suggests mm -hmm. that the transcoded version is better for, um, for real um, screen reader users okay. as opposed to the A designer. Um, so this one is really an extension to be able to automate that process as opposed mm -hmm. to the, the, the thing we did before. Um, but I think that what we'll be doing afterwards is doing a proper uh, full scale study with um, um, screen reader users so that we can understand whether there are um, problems with those mental models that, or, or shall I say that we're designing, we're transcoding pages that which you know, technically don't need transcoding. It might very well be that the, the mental models used by um, screen reader users are not useful in our, well, our pages are not useful to their mental models, if you like. But I think that our initial work, which is why we continued it, suggests that they are, and that, that we see a, a, a bigger increase in um, understandability, perceivability, and also um, search tasks, as opposed to browsing tasks um, for screen reader users. Um, mm -hmm. by using this kind of transcoding. Okay, thank you, Simon. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, um, so let's see if we catch up a little bit of uh, with the schedule. Uh, we have now the first technical uh, paper of the session. Um, the, the paper is called When Headers Are Not There, Design and User Evaluation of an Automatic Topicalization and Labeling Tool to, aid, to Add the Exploration of Web Documents by Blind Users. Um, do we have any of the speakers here? Yes. Hi. Jorge? Hi. Yes. Uh, let me share my screen. Sure. Oh, here it is. Can you see? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so my name is George, and I'm here to present this paper uh, I did with Andre and Paul. Um, I, I can't, uh, oh, okay. Um, so for the introduction, to give a context of the problem we investigated, as we know, uh, the internet has become this massive source of information, and this helped people with impairments to have more independence because of the ease of access, uh, but it doesn't come without uh, its obstacles uh, because uh, our focus was uh, people with visual impairment. So uh, they use screen readers to use computers. And this process can be a little slow uh, because the reading is linear. You can't uh, do diagonal reading in large text or quickly search for uh, keywords as sighted people do. And also, uh, they have many interaction difficulties when using when navigating web pages. Uh, primarily, web pages that have dynamic content or web pages that refresh themselves. And this results in a high cognitive load that can uh, make uh, simple tasks more exhausting for them. And as such, we were exploring how we could uh, try to. Uh, improve their performance or help them in information seeking tasks. And uh, so uh, I bring here two studies that were surveys uh, about how screen reader users usually navigate web pages. And uh, WebM is mostly in North American Europe and Everest was in Brazil. And we can see that although in Brazil, the most uh, used navigation method was reading through the whole page, uh, when it comes to, in terms of shortcuts, the most used one is also just like in WebM, uh, navigating through headings. So because of that, we decided to propose an algorithm to generate these headings automatically and help uh, people with uh, visual impairment uh, when they are trying to search for information on the web. 
and our, our focus was on, on, on large techs, okay? Um, so we had two uh, stages of this project. First one was developing the top segmentation and labeling tool to generate the settings. And the second one was testing the algorithm. Uh, so some key concepts uh, I have to explain because I'm touching a bit on uh, natural language processing. What I mean by top segmentation is it, it is the task of splitting a document by finding the places where topic changes, so the topic boundaries. And we can do that uh, using the information from within the document, like uh, comparing words, or using external sources, just like uh, language models, uh, which is what uh, Niley used. And it's also our case. And by language models, I mean uh, word embeddings in our specific case. And uh, word embeddings are a representation of a vocabulary in a d-dimensional space. So I bring here uh, an image uh, of a two-dimensional uh, space because it's easier to read, but usually uh, it has hundreds or thousands of dimensions. And we can see that words that are closely related, they uh, are also close on the graph. So to the left, we have countries and to the right, we have uh, uh, capitals. And we can also see that um, vertically, they are also aligned to their respective countries. So the capitals are, are, are vertical, vertically aligned with their countries. Uh, because of this characteristic of word embeddings, we can compare our words uh, to find similarity using distance, for example. Um, and also uh, by labeling algorithm, I mean uh, the task of assigning a phrase or words to represent the topics of a document. Uh, usually it's done for many documents, but in our case, we are using topic segments as documents and the whole text as the corpus. And uh, you have many methods of doing that. Uh, you can use co-occurrence of enigrams, which is basically words that uh, come together very frequently, just like user experience. Uh, you can use also top N words, which is our case. Uh, it's basically using the most, frequent the most frequent words of the text. And we can also use external sources, um, like for example, using Wikipedia article titles to label your documents. Uh, so going now for the method, we first had to implement the algorithm. And I bring here uh, the framework of our algorithm. So uh, basically we have an input text that goes through the top segmenting algorithm first. And our uh, SBIRT is basically the word embedding that we use in our case to calculate the similarity between each sentence of the document uh, to generate the similarity matrix. And then we pass a filter to generate this rank matrix. And uh, in this image, uh, the, the, uh, the darker the, the squares on the matrix, it means the sentences are more different. And uh, using that, we try to clusterize uh, sentences that have close similarity. So we, uh, uh, we take that uh, sentences that have a high difference uh, are the top boundaries. This creates a list of top, top segments that is then fed to the top labeling algorithm. And then we use uh, frequency to rank words. Then we group them by synonyms to avoid uh, similar words being used on the label, which would be a waste of space. And then we re-rank them based on these synonyms. Uh, I bring here two examples. Uh, this is the first example. This is a large piece of text. Uh, about, uh, about uh, Queen Elizabeth. It is in Portuguese because our focus was for uh, Brazilian users, but uh, we can see that in bold or in blue. Uh, Independente, uh, it, was, it, is, it is synonym to soberano. So uh, the, these two words were used to rank it uh, and make it go to the label. And in this case, because it's a large text, we have five, um, labels in the header, which is this first line in caps lock. And for smaller fragments of text, uh, we have fewer words because uh, as you, you can see, uh, there aren't enough words to repeat themselves. So 
I, it wouldn't make sense to put many words in the label. And uh, for the user study, we had eight participants with visual impairment and the inclusion criteria was that they had to have little or no residual visual. They had out to be high school graduates. And uh, because of the pandemic, we had to do the test online. So they had to have experience with screen readers and computers. Uh, we had eight participants, uh, six men and two women. They were aged from 22 to 68. Five had total blindness, two had residual light perception, and one had uh, movement perception. And uh, as for experience, five of them were intermediate experienced, and three had advanced experience. And for the test procedure, we had four expositive texts, which would be um, news articles, basically, uh, of 700 words to 1,100 words. And uh, the, the, the text we used uh, on our test uh, were all pre-processed, so because we only had the algorithm working. Uh, the tasks were to read each text and answer three questions related to this text. So in total, we had 12 questions in the experiment. And we allowed participants to use uh, their preferred reading strategy because we didn't want to influence how they will navigate through the text. And after each task, we conducted, uh, we, we had a, a cognitive load score that was between one very low and 10 very high to measure how hard it was for them to complete the tasks. And we also timed each task. Uh, we, we also divided them into groups to be comparable. Uh, we had two scenarios. We had the first two texts with heading generated by the algorithm and the last three uh, and the last two texts without the headings. And we also had uh, the second scenario was the opposite. So the last two texts were with headings generated by the algorithm and the first two didn't have headings. And uh, as for the results of the user study, we could see that um, in, in most cases, the cognitive load, the cognitive load scores uh, decreased. So uh, it means that uh, the tests were easier uh, in the scenarios with headers. And, uh, but it wasn't statistically significant because we didn't have um, as many participants as, as we wanted. And the same thing happened for time taking tests. So we can see that in most cases, uh, the text with headers had, uh, had, uh, took less to complete the tasks. And uh, as far as participant feedback, half of them said that the labels helped them completing tasks. And just remember, the labels were just the most frequent word uh, on the top segment. So I bring here some uh, feedback. Uh, participant two said that uh, he felt like he was running his eye over the text, which was our goal. And participant five also said that uh, he found it more useful on a second read when he has already read it once because he could remember uh, by the words in the label uh, what the, the topic was about. And five of them said that they could infer the top content from header which means uh, by reading the header, they, they could understand uh, or at least guess what was on the top uh, segment. Uh, so participant two said that it helped him when he was searching for information. Participant five said that uh, he didn't like the, the labels very much because they were just a group of words. As I said, uh, it, it was just the most frequent word. So he didn't see much meaning on, on the labels. And participant six said that he noticed that um, it helped him find information, but it, it didn't uh, use as much. Uh, but it, uh, even with that said, he said that having headers helped him uh, because it was less exhausting because of the highlighted words. And uh, all of them said that the headers help in navigation. So even people who didn't like the, the labels that much, they said, they said that just by having them, 
uh, it worked as checkpoints, so they could know where to go to find a specific information that they read. Uh, and as participants five said, it helped them to fragment the text and make a mental map. Uh, participant six also said that he used a lot of the uh, heading navigation shortcut and it was mu much faster for him and gave him more agility. So uh, for the design implications, we saw that dividing text into segments helped them to navigate and explore a document to create a mental map of where everything is in the document. And we also saw uh, by the feedback that they gave us that uh, the navigation inside text of screen readers is still very limited. They said that uh, uh, they can only jump line from, uh, from line to line or in paragraphs, which isn't much useful when the information they're looking for is in the middle of a, a sentence. So uh, alternative methods are still necessary. And uh, we also observed that uh, Brazilian users, uh, even when they know the headings are in the text, they still prefer to, uh, to first navigate the page sequentially, to know where everything is, to map it. And then only then they start using shortcuts. This happened to all the participants. So, uh, for a conclusion, uh, just to recap, we investigated the use of BERT to automatically generate headers to aid screen reader users with information seeking tasks. And in a user study with eight uh, participants, we had positive reactions to the proposed plugin. And uh, it also showed uh, an improvement in performance of participants, but um, it wasn't stati statistically significant. So uh, further research is still necessary to confirm this improvement. And uh, we think that the proposed plugin has the potential to improve their lives because it would make information syncing easier in large text, especially. And for future work, we want to explore uh, other segmentation or labeling techniques because the one, especially the segmentation with BERT, it was uh, too slow. So it wouldn't be uh, very useful in a real case scenario. As I said before, in the test, the texts were already processed. And uh, we also need to improve the labeling algorithm, especially because uh, we saw that many users didn't find the labels themselves very useful. So using word sense disambiguation or syntax tree could help to generate uh, more meaningful labels. And we still need to implement the screen reader plugin. Uh, so yeah, so th uh, that's my presentation and uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you, George. Um, I think there, was, there is a question for you in the chat, but I guess you have more or less answered it uh, when mentioning it in your future work. Ted was asking, um, how could you make the new heading text grammatically correct instead of just a string of words because some participants didn't uh, uh, say it, it was useful but maybe with the syntax trees that you were mentioning that could be help yeah uh, because the problem was that be uh, because we only consider the frequency of words mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the uh, it, it really didn't make much sense um, in large uh, seg uh, top segments but by using syntax trees, we think we can uh, make a, a more natural grammatical st structure. Because uh, we also thought, thought, thought about uh, using uh, like algorithms to generate uh, sentences, but this would uh, make the algorithm slower. So uh, we, did, uh -huh. we wouldn't want that. Okay. Um... There is another question by Simon uh, in the chat. What was the variance in quantitative analysis of the for, for eight participants? Uh, for the, uh, the the cognitive load and the time uh, and the time taken for each task. Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, I don't I don't have it right now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. I. 
is it I, in the I paper think it maybe is in, the, in the article okay yeah so maybe uh, i'm sorry i, I don't no have worries. it in my memory okay so simon maybe you can, will find that in the paper yeah no worries he says um ted uh, has another comment question so he says i noticed in one example that the heading had a different form of a word than what was listed in the paragraph oh yes uh, let me go back to so he doesn't know portuguese but maybe it was a pronoun so is this part of the word analysis yeah to maybe choose? it's this uh -huh. one right uh, yes. and yeah, uh -huh. uh, it, yeah it's because and when we try to find uh, synonyms uh, in our algorithm, we, we couldn't uh, use the co contracted word. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Uh, and and uh, because of that, we need to lemmatize words uh, in, in order to look into in the dictionary, in the synonyms dictionary. So that's mm -hmm. why it appears in the infinitive form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, uh, when we have uh, plurals, like, uh, Independente is in the singular and independent, uh, but it appears as independentes. So that's why uh, it's the singular also. Mm -hmm. We lemmatize them. And, and maybe related to that, um, uh, could you say something on the dependence of your analysis techniques on the language used in the text? Like your algorithm works now for Portuguese, but could it be adapted to other languages? Yeah. Um, uh, the the bird uh, model we used is multilingual, uh -huh. multilingual. So mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't be a problem to uh, use it uh, to other languages. But when we compare uh, synonyms, we used a list of uh, a list of synonyms in Portuguese that we uh, we have from a, a lab in in uh, another university. So uh, for the segmentation part, it is uh, multilingual, but for the labeling aspect, uh, it wouldn't uh, be able to be used in other languages. But uh, you can easily just uh, change the, uh, the dictionary, the synonym dictionary that you are using for the, the algorithm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will have other questions, but maybe I will ask them through the chat later or in Slack, because we are um, a little bit uh, behind the schedule. But thank okay. you anyway, Jorge. Thank you. Thank you. So we have the lunch, the the lunch uh, break afterwards. So I might use five ten minutes from that. Um, I wanted to give uh, authors the opportunity to have some questions and answers. Um, okay, so we have the next technical paper. Um, it's called now the, on the identification of accessibility bug reports in open source systems. And I see that one of the authors is here. Hello, IT. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Right. Okay, we can see your your presentation. So right. the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wajda Jitani. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of North Texas. I'm presenting today my paper, uh, which is titled "On the Identification of Accessibility Bug Report in Open Source System." So I'm presenting this paper on behalf of all the co-authors. Many uh, web application and mobile application has poor accessibility, which is make it difficult for people with disability to use such application or website, several methods, tool and framework and guidelines as well um, to support developers in creating accessibility web and mobile application. However, many um, software developers and designers still uh, do not incorporate with uh, accessibility into their software development process due to lack of awareness and lack of uh, resources. So open source system or an industry software utilizing bug report, bug tracking system or called issue or bug tracking system, such as Bugzilla, 
this uh, tracking system are uh, used to support developers maintaining the software by allowing the end user to submit uh, the issue description um, they faced while they are using software bug reports uh, can describing accessibility issues and that's going to have prevent or for uh, or limited uh, user with disability special needs or functional uh, constraint. So in a related paper uh, or related work, um, LR uh, team uh, did uh, the first study in uh, um, accessibility and user reviews. And what they did, they uh, investigating all the user reviews and they find that out and their approach was manual investigation. And then um, they found that 2,600 accessibility user reviews. And from there, we took our uh, their data set and we, in, uh, in one of our study that uh, published in Kai, we did automate it for that accessibility user reviews to uh, be, um, to be uh, automatic. Uh, to detecting yeah, accessible user view since it's really a uh, time constraint and uh, really uh, manual efforts. Uh, so um, the third paper here, um, David Law team, they did uh, an investigating in accessibility issues in uh, GitHub projects. So they did, um, the first approach was like a keyword string, uh, string matching where they find like a string matching based on the keyword, like for example, accessibility, um, a loving one and all these keywords indicating accessibility and then they did manual analysis to investigating is that an actual or suppose positive and and their work is a gap where it's still like in a manual effort and human resource, uh, human effort and uh, it can be error prone. so our work here uh, to investigating and automatic this uh, this approach to be um, by using uh, supervised machine learning so um, the problem statement um, there is question also can be raised like, can we detecting accessibility reviews using keywords? So people with disability or special needs rely heavily on accessibility software applications in their everyday uh, life, finding accessibility location, customizing UI, um, voice translation, communication, driving, texting, uh, shopping, the everyday life activity, having accessibility related bug can have severe impact on their life that can, can go from preventing, their, uh, from preventing them from participating in their uh, new activities and treating their lives in critical uh, situation due to uh, sensitive natural or disabled, uh, disabled uh, people. Therefore, identif identifying and prioritizing these bug reports are crucial importance, yet Manual investigating of these bug report is time consuming, human and intensive and error prone as I mentioned. The textual uh, natural of bug reports adding another layer of a challenge related to the meaning, meaning of uh, meaning, meaning of uh, uh, ambiguity of this natural language description. So here let's take an example to illustrate this problem. While the first bug report uh, describing um, missing textual uh, label in the graphical component. Um, but um, making it is not accessible for blind user. And the second bug report is related to the performance issues. Despite containing the keyword of the accessibility, uh, this bug is not related to accessibility of uh, the software, but is the performance regression detecting when integrating the accessibility library through its API to the system. So this example shows that we cannot rely on the keyword accessibility to identify accessibility related bug report. As the first example, um, accessibility bug report did not contain the keyword accessibility while the second example non-accessibility bug report did. So uh, the objective of the study to support developer uh, software developers with uh, correction of accessibility errors in their system we propose a classification based approach for automated detection of accessibility bug report. So we apply based on the bug report. We did a supervised learning to detect an accessibility report or non accessibility bug report. So here is the study approach. So in the study approach, we have three steps. The first step is the data collection. So we use Bugzilla and Montreal um, uh, issue tracking system. From there, we uh, got um, open source. Um, projects, um, only seven pro uh, projects we apply for this study, and we crawl the bug reports. From the bug report, um, and the list of the bug report is uh, Firefox, Chromium, and Apache. 
and these are the list of the project. And in the accessibility bug report, out of the seven projects, we found that seven, uh, two, uh, 2,567 um, bug reports, and we also call uh, 256,700 uh, um, non-accessibility uh, non bug report, and the date, uh, the sprint date uh, starting from 1997 until like um, April um, 2020. So uh, then in the second step, the data pre-processing. So in data pre-processing, uh, we're filtering them based on the accessibility tags. And we did uh, after that uh, text pre-processing and text pre-processing, we remove all the uh, non-English language since we focus over here and the only English language uh, bug report. We remove all the text testing um, um, reports, which is like, a, it's named like testing a bug, which is doesn't mean any value. And it's not just just for testing, like um, to test um, submitting a report or any uh, reported tanking uh, for, uh, which is non-meaningful for as a bug report. So uh, the third step is data collection, a data classification. In data classification, we choose um, five algorithms, uh, uh, decision tree, random first, decision jungle, and uh, SVM, and your uh, neural network and then the classify, classify, accessibility, and accessibility. So um, here is more detail about um, the, machi the machine learning approach. We did data pre uh, preparation. In data preparation, we got um, the bug report. From the bug report, we took the description of the bug report. And did, for the description, we got uh, pre-processing. We apply all the tokenization, lemonization, stopping more than all these um, uh, NLB uh, steps that helping us at cleaning the data. And then we did um, feature engineering, which shows uh, feature hashing. Um, as you can see in the, in the figure, data transformation is transforming the plain text uh, to the hashed. And you, as you can see here, um, the work word is can be like this, an example it can be like zero to, uh, to, um, to hashed. And then we did data splitting. From data splitting, we did like 80-20 um, 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 training and testing. And from there, uh, we did the cross validation and the prediction for classifying it accessibility and non accessibility. So, um, study result uh, we have to research uh, research question in our study. The first research question what is the accuracy of the different models in detecting bug reports? So, in this approach, uh, in this research question, we double the number of the um, we double the number of accessibility bug report for each project to run the experiment of uh, RQ1. For instance, for Firefox uh, platform contains 250 um, accessibility bug report, and we double the number of non-accessibility bug report uh, to become 500 bug reports, as it's showing in the table. Uh, then we conduct a template uh, cross-validation procedure to split our data into training a data and evaluation data uh, on the five, <coughs> on the five machine learning uh, models. We use cross validation uh, bec um, because the data we use in the study is imbalanced data. So um, the result, as you can see in the figure, according to the result, all the three uh, based uh, assembled model uh, such as uh, decision tree, random forest and decision jungle perform better um, than the linear model SVM, except the case on uh, Chromium project. And the reason for that, for, for the better performance of the three based uh, assembled uh, model is that when the number of the base learner uh, work on the single problem, problem uh, is, is, is performs better than an individual learning uh, model. Random forest and decision tree are a simple model uh, that um, make a final prediction based on their uh, number of decision tree prediction using a uh, voting criteria. So, um, SVM shows per, uh, poor performance in all the cases except Chromium uh, Chrome project in terms of the accuracy because it's a uh, uh, kernel uh, trick is not uh, to consider more suitable to post the performance on the small and imbalanced data set comparing to the um, tree based model that can uh, perform better um, also on the small data size. So in our research question too, uh, what is the size of the training? data set needed for the classification to effectively identify accessibility bug report. So this question is aimed to investigating the size of um, the data set 
needed for the classi classifiers to classify accessibility bug report. Here we want to examine uh, the performance. So we perform the uh, in RQ2 incrementally increase the data set uh, step by step. So we apply this approach in, in 10 iteration to simply explaining this. Uh, we uh, let me give an example. Uh, in the first iteration, we uh, randomly select ten accessibility bug report and hundred non-accessibility bug report. Then we use random forest classifier to examine the outage in the second iteration, and we uh, we increase the data set by um, size double as the first iteration. Uh, we randomly select twenty accessibility bug report and uh, two hundred non-accessibility bug reports. So um, as you can see in the graph uh, for the evaluation parameters RQ2, we use if, um, F1 score. Uh, accuracy is not considered to be uh, best parameters because we are having imbalanced data issues uh, by incremental increasing such uh, each uh, iteration uh, and by adding the non-accessibility bug report. Um, as you can see in the figure, X axis number shows that the iteration we increase the size of the data for each uh, class after each iteration. If we uh, analyzing random forest uh, performance in each project, we can see that um, it's more consistent as we increase the data set size. So Android project um, model performed very uh, poorly in the first iteration where um, when, the, when, there is, uh, when there are only 10 records in the data, but as the data size increase, model performs gradually and after in six uh, iteration it's become more in, uh, consistent in chromium project is different as compared to the to android the highest score on the um, second uh, iteration compared to the other uh, models random forest perform more uh, accuracy in uh, accurately in the chrome in second iteration even on the small data set uh, it's the reason it can be uh, a good correlation between the features and the target classes in the Chrome dataset. So core uh, uh, project core and Mac uh, dataset and maintaining its consistent until um, the 10th uh, iteration. And um, NetBeans and Firefox data also contain more better correlated feature for the target classes because random forest perform uh, very well on these two uh, projects only uh, after the the three um, iteration and become a consistent performer um, after the third iteration. For the Windows project, uh, the data model performed pretty poorly and achieving the high, uh, the highest uh, eighty-six uh, percent in the F one score and all it, uh, in, the, in all the ten iteration. Uh, but all the model uh, becomes consistent in the in the score after the second uh, iteration, which shows that uh, more. Uh, the model is more accurate when the data data set in, uh, size become large. So um, traits of validity, we have two, um, two traits of validity. The first one, uh, sample bias. Any classified uh, experiment is uh, challenged because we uh, what work in one field may not work in the different field or other field. So to generalize our findings, we use several projects in various domain, mobile and desktop application. Another potential concern of the bias is choosing um, of the classifiers. We also are uh, choosing algorithm widely used in the literature of the software classification and operate very well or well, I would say, uh, with the imbalanced data set and the NLP in literature. So in the second, um, third to validity, external validity, our uh, bold classifier is trained and evaluating an English language bug report we did not consider other languages, uh, we apply our classifier on open source system due to its availability. It's good generalize um, the finding if we can use commercial industry project since the quality of uh, well available of the bug reports varies. So um, feel free to um, to visit our website and um, um, look. And if you have any uh, feedback. Please support us and uh, we share our data set for the, for the study. If you are duplicating, you can find it in our, um, I will share the link in the chat. So um, that's the conclusion and thank you very much for um, listening. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Vaidhi. Um, are there any questions? Maybe while uh, people type them in in the chat, I can ask one. Um, uh, do you think that in the future, uh, the approach you propose could be um, specialized uh, to classify and identify more specific accessibility issues within these uh, bug reports? So now you have classified non-accessibility and accessibility, but within the accessibility reports, that would be possible? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, one potential extension that we are um, working on is that um, we perform a conversion between uh, machine learning and deep learning. So we want to see if transformer can be better classifying for, uh, for this problem. And one of the other potential thing we can classify in bug report based on the accessibility guidelines. So in accessibility guidelines, uh, we have like um, list of guidelines like preview, audio, uh, um, yeah, text and all these guidelines, we might um, uh, clustering or categorizing the data uh, bug reports based on this guideline. And then we can see if we can um, um, successfully predicting this um, uh, based on the category. So we, because one step uh, like ahead, we did binary classification, but we can do a multi-class that can also saving more time for the developers and, uh, and fixing more, uh, fixing the accessibility issues faster than um, at the like spending more time. Mm. Yeah, that would be great. Um, Zagar was asking if the data set that you use is open source. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the data is open source uh, and they share it uh, also in, um, in our website. So feel free uh, to duplicating or replicating our study. And if you have any feedback, uh, here is my information. Feel free to contact and we will be very happy to answer any of your questions. Great. Thank you, Vadi. Thank you very much. So um, now we are moving to the last um, paper in the session. Uh, it's also a technical paper dealing with one of the most well-known best practices, so adding text alternatives for uh, visual content. Um, so I think it's a great uh, topic to, to finish this uh, se morning session. Uh, the title is uh, Towards Supporting Quality Alt Text in Computing Publications, and uh, Cynthia Bennett uh, will be presenting it. Oh, this is Cynthia speaking. Um, Eugen, can you verbally confirm when you've shared? Okay, can you see the slide? We, yes, we can see it. Okay, so, I'm ready. Cynthia, you can start. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your help. So this is Cynthia Bennett speaking and I'll be presenting our paper. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Candace Williams, who's a student at Carnegie Mellon University who did this work while she was an intern at Apple. And I'd also like to recognize my colleagues at Apple, Lillian DeGrief, Ed Harris, Leah Finleader, and Amy Pavel for being co-authors. So next slide. I will start by going over some background information. And next slide. So computing related publications use figures like the examples I'm showing on this slide to do things like show interface features and visualize data. And on the next slide. Um, written descriptions, like um, now what I'm also showing on the slide, often called alt text, ensure that these figures are also accessible to blind readers. And you might not have time to read through the alt text, so I just wanted to visualize what that looks like next to a figure. So next slide. Previous alt text research has examined its prevalence and quality um, on, in contexts like social media. So during one 2018 study, only 0.1% of images on Twitter had alt text. And a quality assessment of 1,000 randomly sampled of these images revealed that only 15% of them had sufficient alt text. So this research shows that alt text is often missing or low quality, but we don't know how this results translates to the different context of computing related papers. Next slide. 
Research on computing related figures, uh, alt text specifically, has distilled best practices. For example, Shari Trewin's guidelines recommend that alt text um, in figures begin with an overview so skimming readers can get the big picture first and so close readers can then learn more details after. But best practices may not cover all cases. For example, these best practices also recommend that alt text be brief. And that could be challenging to follow when figures are complex, like the figures I showed on previous slides, which actually had several images inside of them. Also, recent research has also shown that figures with data visualizations specifically still don't have sufficient alt text. Um, but we don't know how authors are implementing guidelines when they get access to them. And there are a lot of other figures besides data visualizations. Next slide. So we asked these research questions. First, what is the quality of alt text in computing related publications? And second, what barriers do authors encounter when trying to write alt text? Next slide. So now I'll talk about our methods. Next slide. We conducted two studies. In study one, we evaluated alt text prevalence and quality in uh, recent publications. In study two, we interviewed uh, authors authors of computing publications about their experiences writing alt text. Next slide. For study one, we collected a random sample of 300 figures published at the ACM conference on human computer interaction called CHI over three years, 2019, 2020, and 2021. We sampled from this conference and from these years as authors at this conference have recently received more resources on how to write alt text. We then categorized these figures into types and we developed a rubric, which I'll go over next, to evaluate the alt text quality. Next slide. So we rated both alt text and caption quality for each figure according to a rubric that we adapted from related work, including Gleason and colleagues, Young and colleagues, and Shari Trewin's guidelines that I previewed on the previous slide. So I'll go over the five point rubric now. A score of zero indicates that there isn't any description present. A score of one means the description does not contain any useful information, like if it just says figure one. Two means that there was a brief overview. So an example of a brief overview is box plots of user response times in milliseconds for the six experimental conditions. A score of three indicates that there is at least a little more information. So an example corresponding to the brief overview I just read is the red circles indicate the stopping time. And finally, a score of four means that almost all important information is included in the description. Next slide. For study two, we did interviews with 10 authors of recently published computing papers. Our protocol inquired into their experiences creating figures and alt text. Participants then did an alt text writing activity um, with Trewin's guidelines, which we used as a probe. They spent five minutes each writing alt text about two of their previously published figures. And this probe opened up conversations on current challenges and opportunities to make the process easier. Next slide. The 10 participants researched in a variety of computing domains, including HCI, machine learning, visualization, design, software engineering, accessibility, computer science education, and learning sciences. And they also had a variety of experiences writing alt text. Eight participants had between one and seven years of experience, and the other two participants had never written alt text before. Next slide. So now I'll go over some results from these studies. Next slide. From study one, I'll share results about figure type frequency, caption and alt text prevalence and quality, and comparisons of quality scores to word count and publication year. And you can read our paper to get a lot more information about the results. Next slide. First, I'll talk about figure types. This data shows the percentage of figures from our sample that had at least one of each of these respective figure types. So the most common type was images, which occurred in 47% or 142 of the 300 figures. The most common subtypes being photos, illustrations, and screenshots. Next, data visualizations appeared in 33% or 98 figures. Next, 17 or 17% 17 or 50 figures contained a diagram. And finally, tables and text 
plots occurred in uh, formatted as images occurred least often in 4% and 6% of figures respectively, but we highlight them because they could have been formatted as more screen reader accessible content by default. Recent computing papers publish a variety of figure types suggesting that maybe authors might need some tailored alt text instructions depending on figure type. These percentages add up to more than 100 because in 38% or 115 figures, there were multiple elements, meaning they contained repeating instances of a figure type like several bar charts or more than one type, like an image of a system next to a chart. Current guidelines don't cover multi-element figures. Next slide. So now I'll share overall description quality scores. These scores combine the individual scores from the caption and the alt text fields. So after removing empty fields, 38% or 114 of the 300 figures received a description score of two. So that means together the caption and alt text only provided an overview, like the one I mentioned earlier, box plots of user re response times in milliseconds for the six experimental conditions. 30% or 89 figures received a score of three, meaning that they only had kind of one, uh, at least one more piece of useful information. And 23% um, uh, or 68 figures received a score of four for uh, pointing out most of the information needed to understand the figure. Next slide. So next I'll share caption quality scores. So 69% or 185 figure captions scored a two. 23% or 68 captions scored three, and 5% or 16 captions scored a four. And next slide. Now I'll share the distribution of alt text quality scores. So 45% of figures scored a two, 29% or 56 figures scored a three, and 26% or 51 figures received a four. So from these combined and individual scores I've shown, we can see that caption and alt text quality are um, quite varied and there is a, still a lot of room for improvement. And I'll talk a little bit more about this kind of caption and alt text differences in later in the talk. Next slide. So next we examine the relationship between description length and quality scores. So I'm showing a graph with combined alt text and caption word length on the X axis and the number of figures that had descriptions of each of those links on the y-axis. Um, also quality score uh, is shown in colors with higher quality scores in green. And overall, as the description length increases, for example, 40 words or longer, we notice um, the scores seem to be more likely to be a little bit higher, by example, getting a three or a four quality score. Next slide. Finally, Kai authors have received more resources, um, which we enumerate in the paper to write alt text. They got more resources in 2020, and then again, more resources in 2021. So we compared description quality score to publication year. We found a modest but not significant increase in quality over time. There's a decrease in the number of figures with blank alt text fields, and the number of figures that have at least an overview is increasing. Um, so guidelines might be helping, but there is still room for improvement as the average quality score in 2021 was still only uh, 2.81 out of 4. Next slide. So now I'll share a few findings from our interview study, and you can read a lot more details about this in the paper. Participants found that publication pipelines and popular paper writing tools incentivize them to wait to write alt text at the last minute. So P6 um, needed more reminders and instructions saying because alt text is optional in LaTeX, um, which was a very popular tool among our authors. Because it's optional in LaTeX, you could um, publish it and no warning would be raised. And several participants wrote alt text at the last minute for practical reasons, like P10, who explained, if you change even a little word or something in the source file, you have to, to go back um, it's a very clerical process to add all the accessibility alt text again. Next slide. Some participants like P8 shared that they weren't sure if their written alt text showed up in the final paper saying, we didn't get guidelines for us to actually check uh, the alt text uh, to make sure it was saved correctly. 
Um, so this is like one of the most sad parts of interviews. Like we would go back and check their papers and some participants had written all text and something in the pipeline happened and it didn't actually show up in the publication in the digital library. So that was pretty unfortunate. So several participants had read instructions um, for composing all text and they had difficulty implementing it with popular tools and while adhering to the requirements of their publication pipeline, current all text content guidelines are often separated from documentation on how to actually implement it using different tools. And several of these tools are just simply not very easy to do. Next slide. Finally, interviewees were also confused about what information belonged in the caption and alt text. And so you remember there are kind of differences um, in the scores earlier. Um, so for an example, P4 said, alt text is supposed to be brief, but I have no idea what are the key elements I should talk about because my figure caption already describes the figure. So what's missing that is in the picture that I need to describe? So currently guidelines focus on all text only and may not help cited authors understand the difference between providing context for everyone, which is necessary for a caption and providing access to the visual information, which is appropriate for the all text field specifically. Next slide. Now I'll move on to share some discussion and future work. Next slide. With the analysis of existing descriptions and participant experiences, we learned that there's still a lot of room for improvement, even with increased access to all text guidelines. Um, our participants kind of echoed the analysis saying that they needed more support from their tools and research communities, not only to create high quality alt text, but to implement it correctly with their tools. Next slide. The paper has recommendations addressing uh, each of the findings that I went over. Um, today, I just have time to briefly share a few a subset of design recommendations that we have for paper and figure authoring tools to better support alt text. So first, we recommend that tools might automatically detect figures, um, the figure type and present authors with specific instructions on how to make that specific figure type um, alt text. And next, um, uh, tools might allow authors to outline their different elements in their multi-element figures and then present the respective guidelines um, and give authors warnings when they have not written all text, either for an entire figure or for even specific elements in the figure. Next, tools might also be able to automatically identify a text and symbol annotations and recommend them to scaffold what might be included in the alt text. So for example, labels on a chart uh, might be important to include in the alt text. And if a system detects symbol notification uh, annotations like arrows, it might ask the author to explain the relationship between different boxes in a diagram. And finally, um, there are techniques in um, natural language processing that can find redundancies in text and recommend ways for people to shorten it to make alt text more efficient and brief. Next slide. Um, so I have a URL to download the paper. If you're accessing the talk down visually, my website is bennettc.com. There's a publications link in the top level menu and you can search the paper title towards supporting, uh, towards supporting quality alt text and computing publications and you can download the paper. You can also follow me on Twitter at CLB5590. And thank you for coming to this talk and thanks to the conference organizers for their help with the screen share. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, your, your work shows that there is still some work to do in terms of aware, raising awareness on, uh, among authors on how to improve the, the uh, quality of the text alternatives in these publications. Um, are there any questions questions for Cynthia. No. 
Not yet. Okay. Um, the reviewers left some questions um, uh, for you, so maybe I can share one or two. Um, so one one of the reviewers uh, were asking was asking from all the recommendations that you share in the paper and that some of them you mentioned them now in the presentation. What do you think is uh, the priority? What are the most important issues that need to be tackled? Um, this is Cynthia speaking. Thanks. We got a lot of great feedback from the reviewers, so really appreciate that. Um, oh my gosh. I think <laughs> for me, I would love, this is like maybe more of a personal preference. I would mm -hmm. love tools to be work better. Like, I think it's very unfair the amount of pr pressure we put on people to find different resources in different places. Like, okay, you have the all text guidelines and then, okay, you have the how do you do it in LaTeX? And then you have to use the TAPS process with the ACM, which actually can strip accessibility out of the PDF. So I think that is a huge disservice we're doing to people. And so I would love um, the tooling. I think there's at a basic level can even just have um, like tips and guidelines embedded. And then I think there's some automation techniques that could further improve that process. So I would like to see tools that take some of the burden um, off of individual people. Yeah, definitely. And maybe related to um, to one of the things you mentioned, the TAPS process in ACM. Um, some of the reviewers were interested in your opinion regarding what is the role of ACM in the meantime. So while we work on better guidelines and tools, uh, how they could help uh, um, with this. Yeah, this is Cynthia speaking again. So we talked about this in the paper. I, I hesitate to offer this because I don't want to create like really burdensome workflows, but mm -hmm. you know, there could be student volunteer positions or there could be feedback loops scaffolded on how to um, maybe teach people how to write better alt text and, and make sure that it's implemented. So um, I know the assets conference does allocate some student volunteer positions for PDF accessibility. So that's I think something that could be useful and, and we think about other fields like in design, you know, we do design critiques all the time. Um, and so maybe we could kind of build some um, feedback loops and, and critiquing culture around the accessibility aspects of papers as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, at W4A, we, we do run uh, accessibility checks of the PDF submitted, but obviously we are an accessibility conference, so we are more aware of that uh, assets as well. Mm -hmm. But it would be great if other computing related conferences uh, have similar uh, feedback loops as you were suggesting, yes. Okay, so I don't see any more questions coming up uh, in the chat, so I think we can close this session thank you for bearing bearing with us until until now we went a little bit behind the schedule but still on time for the lunch break so um, uh, from the program i can see that uh, we will be coming back at 1 30 uh, p.m leon time for the next session which is the keynote by julio abascal so if i if there are no other announcements or maybe Victoria or Dragon want to add something else? No, okay. other than saying thank you, Sylvia, for chairing a wonderful session. And thank you to all of the presenters. This was great material. And I don't want to keep people from their lunch or dinner or, or snack, wherever you are. So we'll see you back again at 1.30 Leon time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. It was a great session.